Hey folks, my name is Shay Parker and this is RTFM, the show where I teach you how to play a game, or sometimes an expansion or two, which is what I'll be doing today with the War of the Ring expansions, Lords of Middle-Earth and Warriors of Middle-Earth. Now this is a big game and these are some big expansions, so I might need a little help. Luckily, I know just who to call. Hey Shay, what's up? Mike, so I'm doing the War of the Ring expansions, and I know the last time I wasn't too keen on going deep into the lore, but I just reread the books, I watched Rings of Power, and I'm all in. Okay, let's do it. Give me the history, give me the poetry, give me Tom Bombadil's Chipotle order. I'm ready for it. Oh boy, well, here's the thing, man. We're actually done with Lord of the Rings. What? Yeah, we're all about Star Wars now. What? Yeah, it's really the modern mythology, and they keep coming out with new shows and things, plus the merchandising options are endless. I mean, I'm talking Baby Yoda, BB-8, have you even seen Babu Frick? Yeah, they're, they're cute, but... I... Oh, oh, and we've been re-watching the prequels, and let me tell you, they hold up better than you would think. I mean, the political intrigue in that is so nuanced that you would easily forget that there's also a wonderful love story. Well, that's disappointing. I guess we'll just get on with it. Plus, there's this whole conspiracy theory of Jar Jar Binks is actually a Sith Lord, and it recontextualizes the entire story. Obviously, I'm kidding, man. Yeah, we're down to help out. When you need us over. Hello? Did you mess this up for us again? Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, oh. Oh, no, no. So I'm going to start with the Lords of Middle-Earth, but before I do, a couple important things. First off, this video is just going to teach expansions. If you're curious about the base game, I taught that a while ago, and you can find the link in the top right corner now. I'm also only going to be teaching the two-player rules. If you want to learn the multiplayer rules, they aren't hard to figure out. Second, while I try not to make any mistakes, I do not have the wisdom of the elves behind me, so I do occasionally goof things up. If that happens, I'll be making corrections in the Klingon subtitles, so please turn those on now, or at least check the description below. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get started. Lords of Middle-Earth adds a number of gameplay elements that focus on certain powerful individuals in the Tolkieniverse. What that means for you is that each side will have a few new characters that come with their own special dice, a few things have been upgraded, like Aragorn and Gandalf the White, some characters have optional variants, and Gollum's alter ego Smeagol will be popping up here and there to... help? Sure, why not. So, let's get this to the table and set it up. First off, there are a few things to add and replace. These long elven ring tokens will replace the old ones you had. This new Balrog card replaces the original one, and each side will have six new event cards to add to their respective decks. When constructing the hunt pool, add two of the four Smeagol tiles, leaving the others to the side. When starting the game, you can now choose either Gandalf the Grey or Strider to be your guide, and when either of them upgrade, feel free to replace their figure with the cool new ones. There's no mechanical change here, they're just awesome. And lastly, this is optional, but you can use the alternate versions of the companions and potentially start them off in other locations. So let's talk about how that works. Now, unlike everything else in this expansion, this part is something you don't have to add in. But if you want to, each companion has an alternate card with new abilities. We've got a lot to cover, so I won't go over each one. But if you do want to play with these, during setup, you can decide which version of each companion you want to use and add them into the Fellowship without revealing your choices to the Shadow Player. Which one you chose will obviously be revealed if they become the guide, or if they leave or are eliminated, though. And speaking of, you also have the option of choosing whether or not they start in the Fellowship at all. Each alternate companion except Strider and Gandalf can instead start the game on the map in their respective homeland, shown on the card. However, there is a cost to this. If one companion does this, the Shadow Player gets to pick one of these special action tokens, and if it's more than one, they get both. These are one-time use tokens that can be used instead of an action die and are then discarded. The Nazgul token lets you move the Nazgul and minions, same as if you spent a character die to do so, and the political token lets you advance one shadow nation on the political track, same as a muster die. Only one token can be used in a turn, and they aren't counted when determining whether or not a player can pass. Okay, so those are a big deal, but they are optional. Everything from here on out needs to be included if you're playing with the Lord's expansion. So let's start with these new characters and their special dice. Each die is tied to their character, and each character has a special way of entering the game. These dice are powerful, but there's also risk involved in using them. When you have access to them, they'll be rolled alongside your other dice, but if you have more than one, you'll have to choose one of them and discard the rest for the turn. If both players need to choose, whichever player rolled the most dice chooses first, or the free people's player if tied. However, each of these dice has an eye on it, which will go into the hunt box just like Sauron's do, and if any of your special dice come up eyes, you have to pick one of those. 
On the free people's side, we have the three keepers of the elven rings, Elrond and Vilya, Galadriel and Nenya, and Gandalf and Narya. If you didn't know that Gandalf had an elven ring, well, he does, and it's complicated. Don't worry about it. Now, for Elrond and Galadriel, they can be added to the game if Sauron or the elves are at war, and their stronghold, Rivendell or Lorien respectively, is unconquered. Just spend a mustard die, and bam, you got a brand new elf and the die that comes with them. Gandalf is just a touch more complicated. Even if you aren't using the other alternate companions, you can still use Gandalf the Grey, Keeper of Narya. And if you are, as long as Gandalf is the guide, if this is the first round of the game, or a round in which you recovered any free people's dice from the hunt box, you'll add the Narya die to your dice pool for that round. Meaning that in order to keep using it, you'll need to keep the fellowship moving. Each of the keepers also has some cool abilities, so take a look when you get a chance. For now, let's talk about the dice themselves. Most of these symbols will be familiar to you, but there is a new one here, and some of the faces have these stars next to them. The new face allows you to draw one card from either of your event decks. It's like a palantir, only not as good. The stars refer to a condition by which you'll lose the die. For the free peoples, if you choose a die with a star and Gandalf the White is in play when you recover it, that die will be removed from the game. This is a problem considering that Vilya and Nenya both have stars in their eyes, so you may want to delay putting out Gandalf the White if you're worried about losing these elven dice. Of course, you'll also lose the die if their keeper is eliminated, so depending on your board state, it might not be that big of a deal. And the last thing to talk about for the elven rings is their new abilities. They still have the original ability of changing a die face, but this can't be used to change a special die. In addition, each of them now has a new ability that you can use by spending their token, but only if the associated character is in play. Vilya allows you to hold onto a die you just used, so you can use it again later. Nenya lets you cancel the effects of and remove a standard hunt dial and draw a new one. And if Gandalf the Grey Keeper of Narya is in an unconquered settlement, you can use Narya and spend any action die to activate a nation and move it directly to war. These special uses still require you to give the token to the shadow player, but they aren't subject to the one use per turn rule that normal ring use is. Next up, let's look at the lesser minions, Gothmog and the Balrog of Moria. These have special dice just like the keepers, and they work much in the same way. Whether you roll one or both of them, you must choose exactly one die to use, and you have to pick an eye if one shows up. And if you pick a face with a star on it, that die will be removed if the Witch King is in play when you recover it. Now, Gothmog is pretty straightforward. You can play him into Minas Morgul with a mustard die if Sauron is at war, Minas Morgul is unconquered, and the Witch King Black Captain is not in play. If the Black Captain comes into play, you'll lose the die, but Gothmog will stick around. Now, the Balrog is a little different. From the start, you can bring it into Moria with a mustard die, and if Moria is unconquered and not under siege, you also get a Sauron unit, regular or elite. However, when it gets played, you also advance the elves and dwarves one step each on the political track. The Balrog starts out inactive, and there's a counter to show this, which also indicates its level, meaning that while inactive, it can't leave Moria. If you spend a Balrog die, however, you can activate the Balrog, raising its level to 2. Once active, you can use Balrog symbols to move or attack with the Balrog the same way a character die would be used. However, the Free Peoples may make the Balrog inactive by using a Will of the West, or a character die if any version of Gandalf is in the same region. And if the Balrog is made inactive while not in Moria, it is eliminated. So that's all for the special dice, but there are a couple more characters to talk about, starting with the alternate versions of the Mouth of Sauron and the Witch King. Now, unlike the alternate companions, these are not optional, but you can choose which version to bring out, and you can do so while playing. Whichever version of the Mouth you play, put the other one in the box. You made your choice. But with the Witch King, you can switch from one version to the other once per game. As with all the other characters, I won't go into detail, but the Black Numenorian is very good at moving armies and extending sieges, whereas the Chief of the Ringwraiths specializes in hunting down the Fellowship. I'll also say that if the Witch King is in play, you can replace them with their other version with a mustard die, provided the prerequisites for the new version are met, because they are different. Oh, and one last thing, the Chief of the Ringwraiths, as well as Gothmog and the Balrog, are not considered minions for the purpose of playing Gandalf the White. Now, at last, we must address Smeagol, the original personality of Gollum. See, while Gollum is an absolute turd, Smeagol is kind of okay. And if Smeagol had taken the reins instead of Gollum, things might have gone a bit easier for Frodo and Sam. The way this works in the game is that if you draw a Smeagol tile during a hunt check, and Gollum is not already the guide, no damage is applied, the token is removed from the game, and Smeagol enters play as the new guide of the Fellowship. 
His level is equal to that of the highest level companion in the fellowship, and he applies a few special conditions. Most of these are written on his card, but some aren't, and I'm gonna go over them, but I also recommend having these pages open as soon as Smeagol comes into play. First, let's talk about his guide abilities. He can be sacrificed like any other guide, but he'll also be discarded if you ever declare in a free people's city or stronghold. This is an issue because if he's discarded or eliminated in any way, you'll flip over the Shadow Smeagol card, We Shall Get It, which is not something you're gonna want. However, this doesn't occur if Smeagol is replaced by Gollum, which happens if he is the only companion left in the Fellowship. Now, having Smeagol as your guide isn't too bad, because when you draw these Smeagol tokens, they'll just keep getting removed from the game without causing damage. However, there's also an event that flips them around, so it's not exactly smooth sailing. It's important to note, though, that Smeagol is not Gollum, so any cards that specify Gollum can't be used if Smeagol is the one in play. Okay, now for the edge cases. Smeagol is considered a companion, so he is counted when determining the max number of action dice the Shadow Player can add to the hunt box. Smeagol can be separated from Fellowship by choice, but he is discarded if you do so. If Smeagol is no longer in play, Gollum can enter normally, and if you draw a Smeagol tile after he leaves the game, or if Gollum comes out before Smeagol does, discard the tile and draw another one. You only get one chance with this little gremlin, so make it count. And that's all for the Lords of Middle-Earth, but maybe you want a little more combat. Well, next we've got the Warriors expansion, so let's dive in. Alright, so the Lords expansion added a few different elements, each of them providing subtle changes, but the Warriors are all about one thing. Peace. Wait, no. War. That's right, this expansion brings in armies belonging to six new factions, the Ents, Eagles, and the Dead Men of Dunharrow on the Free People's side, and the Spiders, Dunlundings, and the Corsairs of Umbar for the Shadow. Each of them works differently, and I'll cover all of that, but first let's get set up. So each of these armies is formidable, but none of them start out on the board like the normal units do, so just keep them on the sidelines for now along with their faction reference cards, the faction dice, and these call the battle cards, which look like event cards but don't have a symbol on the top right. Each side will also need to remove a few cards and add some new ones to their respective event decks. In addition to this, both players get a whole new deck of event cards, the Faction deck. And since that's all you need to do for setup, let's start talking about those Faction event cards first. These are all about playing, strengthening, and utilizing your new factions, and they count as event cards in most respects. You'll draw one at the beginning of each turn, and they count towards any effects that target event cards in general, so Gandalf's Guide ability, for example, will work with them. They do have a couple differences though. For one, they don't count against your six card hand limit. Instead, they have their own four card hand limit, which is counted separately. And the big difference is that if you run out of faction cards, you do get to reshuffle their discard and make a new draw pile. Now when it comes to playing faction cards, they work just like any other event card, but there are a few things to note when it comes to recruiting faction units. First off, each faction has a specific requirement in order to be brought into play. We'll cover those more in a minute, but for now, just know that if they aren't in play yet, a card that recruits more of them has no effect. That is, unless it increases their starting setup, in which case you add the figure to the reference card. Factions can also be eliminated, and if that happens, they won't ever come back. So as you might expect, cards that recruit eliminated faction units will also have no effect. And lastly, some cards will allow you to place units on them. These units aren't in play, and if the card is lost, the units go back to your reinforcements. Next, let's talk about the faction dice. As soon as you bring a faction into play, you'll start rolling this die with all the others at the beginning of your next turn. This continues as long as you have any of your faction units on the board. If that stops being true, you stop rolling the die, but you can get it back if you put another faction out. Anyway, this die is a little different from your action dice. While you spend it in the same way, and it is counted when determining whether or not a player can pass their turn, it does not count as an action die for any other purposes unless specifically stated. So Elven Rings, for example, cannot change the result. What these dice do is allow you to recruit faction units, shown by these symbols, and play or draw faction cards, shown by these. And if a die shows two symbols, choose one of them, just like the Army Muster die. The Shadow die also has an eye, which works as you'd expect, and a wild side, which can trigger any faction die ability. Okay, so we've talked about these armies long enough, let's bring them into the fight. As I've mentioned, each faction has its own conditions that you have to meet before they can show up. So the Spiders, for example, need the Fellowship to be anywhere but Rivendell. Once that's the case, you can use a Muster or Recruit Faction die to hatch their eggs and get them going. Flip the card and take a look at their starting setup, which will tell you where to place units. In this case, one in Dol Guldur and one in Minas Morgul. Faction units are not the same as regular units and don't count towards their stacking limit, so it's a good idea to keep them separate from your other units as much as possible. 
In fact, they aren't really part of your armies at all. Unless otherwise stated, they don't move or retreat with friendly armies, and if an army dies in their space, they're unaffected. They also don't block enemy movement and can't be targeted by enemy attacks, nor does their presence affect the political track or give control of a region. The one way they are like units, though, is the fact that Free People's Faction units are removed from the game when eliminated, whereas the Shadow Faction units just go back to your reinforcements. So with all that, you might be wondering what they're even good for. Well, we'll get to each faction's abilities in a moment, but the way they can all interact with the game is through these Call to Battle cards. See, each faction has a Call to Battle condition, and when a battle starts, if their condition is met, you get to draw the two cards matching each available faction into your hand. These cards have backs that match the other event cards, but that's just to keep your intentions secret, because these cards can be played instead of combat cards at the beginning of each combat round. They can also be cancelled or prevented like combat cards, but after each combat round where you play the Call to Battle card, you may return the card to your hand, and as long as the Call to Battle conditions are still met, you can keep playing these cards. Once the battle is done, discard all Call to Battle cards and set them aside for later. Alright, you've eaten your vegetables, and you technically know all you need to know to start playing, but let's take a look at each of these factions and see what they're all about, starting with the Dead Men of Dunharrow. These ghosty boys were called to action by Aragorn to defend Minas Tirith, so in order to recruit them, you need to bring Strider or Aragorn within one region from Eric, and the mountain line doesn't block this adjacency. They start with two in Eric, and they must always be with Strider or Aragorn, so immediately move him and any other companions in a space you want to bring to Eric to form the Army of the Dead, even if they were in a stronghold under siege. If they run out of ghosts or their king leaves them behind, they're immediately eliminated, but each recruit will bring one more into the Army of the Dead wherever it is. This army will always move as a group, but can only do so through the Wraiths of Fear card. However, this lets them move and attack multiple times in one turn. You'll just need to have a lot of ghosts on hand, because each move and attack requires you to sacrifice a dead man. That being said, the attacks hit hard. You roll three dice and score hits on four or higher. Then, when you choose to stop attacking, if there are any surviving units, they must retreat into an adjacent region, and you can move the army of the dead into their space without removing another dead man. This is all on top of their Call to Battle abilities, which can be triggered if the army is in the same region as or adjacent to the defenders, so these wraiths are not to be underestimated. Next up are the Eagles of the Misty Mountains. They're tired of everyone saying they should have helped out sooner, so they're flapping their way into battle. They can be brought into the game if the Fellowship are out of Rivendell or Gandalf the White is in play, and we'll start with two birds in Eagle's Eyrie. This is also where you'll put an eagle when you recruit them, and just like the Nazgul, these birds can go anywhere they want when a card lets you move all eagles. They're eliminated if they're eliminated, and they can call the battle if they're within four regions of the defending army, ignoring mountain borders. If they join the fight, move some or all of them to the region with the battle. These eagles can fight okay, but their biggest strength comes in countering Nazgul or helping out the Fellowship. Finally. And lastly for the Free Peoples are the Ents of Fangorn. These ancient tree herders were slow to act, but did so decisively when needed. They need Saruman in play and a companion or the Fellowship to be in Fangorn and once they're brought in, place two Ents there. They recruit one in Fangorn, and always need at least one Ent to stay there at all times, either with a companion or the Fellowship. If either condition ever changes, the Ents are eliminated. The way the Ents work is by forming the Entwood, which is the group of Ents in Fangorn, and moving and attacking from there. When moving via March of the Ents, take an Ent from the Entwood, and move it to a region adjacent to an Ent, eventually making a snake of angry trees towards their opponent. When attacking, eliminate an Ent from the Entwood and roll three dice, hitting on fours or higher. And you can keep moving and attacking just like with the Dead Men, provided you have enough trees in your forest. If an Ent moves into Orthanc or an attack of theirs eliminates all units there, remove Saruman from the game. They can also call to battle when any Ents are in or adjacent to the defending army. It takes them a while, but once they pull up their roots, they can cause some serious havoc. Okay, so sure, the good guys have some fun toys, but let's talk about the Shadow Factions next, starting with the Corsairs of Umbar. These pirates caused a lot of trouble for Gondor's coastal cities, and that's going to be no different here. Once the Southrons and Easterlings are at war, you can bring them in, starting with three ships in Umbar, and bringing one more here each time you recruit. They do have a stacking limit of five, and they can only move to coastal regions on the Western Sea, Asgiliath, and any Gondor regions except for Eric. So that's what they can't do. Here's what they can. First off, they're only eliminated if the Free Peoples control Umbar, which is not an easy task. 
When it comes to movement, a great fleet will move all of them up to four spaces individually, but Ships of Great Draft allows you to transport two shadow armies and drop them off somewhere, or one army and then fight with them. Corsairs won't otherwise move with armies, but if they're in a space with an attacking army and that army wins, they can move into the attacked space if they're allowed to be there. They also call to battle while in the Shadow Army's region, unless they're under siege, in which case the Corsairs just sit and watch. These ships are more movement-focused than they are attackers, but supply lines are an important part of any war effort, so they can definitely be put to good use. Up next, we have the Hillmen of Dunland. These ornery humans were recruited by Saruman to fight against Rohan, for whom they had a long-held hatred. So in the game, they can only be brought in if Saruman is in play. They start with two in North and South Dunland, and can recruit one in each space for one die, or one in a Shadow Army in Isengard or Rohan. They'll be eliminated if the Free Peoples control both Dunland settlements, and they have a stacking limit of just three, but unlike most other faction units, they can move and attack with armies as if they were a part of them. But if they go to battle with an army, they'll also have to advance or retreat with them, or be eliminated if the army is destroyed. They can also move by themselves, and if they do, they move two spaces at a time, but they can't move across impassable borders or into a region with a Free People's Army or Unconquered Stronghold unless it's under siege. They can be called to battle if in the same space as the Shadow Army, and while they aren't especially powerful at first, they are great meat shields, and when the Armed by Saruman card is in play, they become a force to be reckoned with. And last up, we've got the Broods of Shelob. As we said, they need the Fellowship to get out of Rivendell, and then they can put a spider in Dol Guldur and Minas Morgul, recruiting in both places as well. These spiders can't go into regions with Free People's armies or unconquered Free People's settlements, except for strongholds under siege, and if they all get killed, the spiders are eliminated. Just like the Dunlandings, they can move and attack with shadow armies, and must advance, retreat, or be eliminated with said armies. They have no stacking limit until they become huge and horrible, after which they take up a normal unit's amount of space. They're called to battle if they're in the same region as the Shadow Army, and while they can definitely contribute to a fight, their abilities make them more of a support class in combat. Also, their faction events are largely to do with hindering the Fellowship, which makes them very crafty allies to have. And that's how you play with the Warriors of Middle-Earth expansion. It took a while, but I'm glad I finally got these expansions to the table. I hope you like them just as much as I do. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!